everyone. Uh, welcome to a Total Health interview here. Um, <clears throat> we've got we've got a great interview today. Uh, we we have two kind of levels of interviews going on at the moment, <clears throat> and they are Ask the Ex Expert and an inspirational inspirational interviews with kind of. You know, exceptional people and athletes and stuff, and I think uh, this man, man Steve Cotter, kind of fits into both of them. You know, he's um, way up there as far as kind of knowledge and expertise in the fitness industry is concerned, uh, but also an inspirational athlete. And uh, I've been lucky enough to kind of train under Steve, doing some uh, doing the CKT kind of workshop, um, and it kind of blew me away just really kind of on a level and depth of what was covered, not just on kettlebells, but the whole, whole kind of the whole circumference of kind of health was really covered in a couple of days, and that's kind of what really pulled me back to um, following Steve and the, uh, the IKFF and kind of want, want to get Steve on this interview. So uh, thanks a lot for coming. Steve looks a lot more comfortable and relaxed than I, I am in the sunshine there. You know? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Craig. Uh, it's nice nice to talk to you, and thanks for, uh, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a pleasure. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do the usual kind of kick, kick off, Steve. Uh, most people kind of know you, who you are and been following you in the fitness industry, but do you want to give us a little bit of background about kind of where you started and how you got to where you are now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I've always followed my interests. I've always, um, I, I consider I've never really had a, a real job. Um, I've always uh, just... I figured out a way to make my my interest, my passion, also my profession. So I'm really happy about that, grateful uh, for that. Um, I was first became uh, immersed into uh, physical culture, you could say, through via the martial arts when I was 12 years old. It's going back to 1982. Um, I'm 45 years old now. Uh, so I, I started studying martial arts very seriously from the age of 12 and pretty much was immersed in that, you know, full time, all day, every day type of thing for about 15 years. Uh, and it was my first first profession as well. I started teaching on a part time basis or around the age of 15 and then full time by, by 18. And uh, then a. Uh, 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 in, in that uh, aspect of training, it was traditional Chinese martial arts. So there was, um, you know, there was the fighting arts, also the healing arts, uh, meditation, knowledge about herbal medicines, um, qigong, which is the breathing arts. So it was a very integrated, not just in the physical conditioning and the fighting, but also in the health health arts. And that sort of set the foundation for my my uh, philosophy and outlook on. Uh, what I call mind, body, wellness, and fitness. Yeah. Um, in my late twenties, I made the analysis that I wasn't going to be teaching martial arts for the rest for the rest of my life as a business model, mm -hmm. and so I decided it would be a good time to to get some academic training. So I uh, went into university at that time. It's going back to I guess ninety seven. And I ended up getting my degree in uh, kinesiology, which is an exercise science degree. Um, coming out of university, this would have been 2001. Uh, just around around that time, um, uh, I guess early 2002, I, I started seeing the, these advertisements for kettlebell training. And it was very new uh, phenomenon in, in the U.S. as far as a fitness tool yeah. and method. And um, so it intrigued me right away because of just the, the advertisements talked about its value as a, um, you know, more athletic training, being on your feet, training in all three, three dimensions. And so um, I invested in some kettlebells and just started playing with them on my, my own, no formal training. Uh, but I was able to learn the basic techniques pretty well just because, because of my extensive background that I, that I already have been bringing to it with the flexibility and conditioning. Um, so I got involved with the existing kettlebell community at that time, and I became one of the one of the senior instructors helping Pavel Satsaline uh, conduct his courses. At that time, they were just in the U.S. Yeah. and continued to evolve, uh, uh, continued to study, and 
began integrating what I was learning with kettlebells with my, my own um, understanding about martial arts training and um, developed some programs based around that. Uh, I started getting re, uh, requests for workshops and seminars around, around the U.S. This is around 2004, starting that. And um, I was approached by a, a producer that dealt with uh, mostly martial art instructional videos. He was moving into kettlebell instructional videos. And so uh, we ended up doing quite a few uh, uh, products together, different DVD instructional uh, educational programs. And, and so based on that, my, um, my name started getting out there and, you know, a lot of clips on YouTube and this type of thing and started getting a following. Uh, so I would get in inquiries about seminars for different parts of the world. Uh, starting in 2007, I started uh, teaching all around the world. Actually, my first international seminar or my second was in the UK, yeah. um, in London. And then um, ever since then, it's just been kind of nonstop going around the world. And, and um, I've, I've been able, able to introduce kettlebells to uh, about 60 different countries now, um, pretty much every, every continent minus Antarctica. So I've been, been really busy with that. Um, and so that's a little bit of background as far as how I got involved and what I've been doing, yeah. you know, since, uh, since 1982 up yeah. until now. Um, my, my, my personal interest is as a student, you know, I, I'm a teacher, but I, I also always, uh, like to keep, you know, some, emptiness in my cup, so to speak. I yeah. like to uh, always be in a position where I can learn learn from other people. Um, all things related to health and wellness, um, uh, performance, longevity, these, yeah. these are really important things for me. And um, so, you know, cur currently um, I've really cut back a lot on the seminar. I've, I've been able to develop some other, you know, very high level instructors that are able to uh, um, you know, run courses for me in different different parts parts of the world. I still do do seminars myself, but I've I've really cut back on my travel. Yeah. And um, I have three children, so you know, it's nice to be able to yeah. be able to be around front for them as much yeah. as I can, um, as well as my wife. And um, uh, what I'm doing now is I'm starting to work with uh, professional baseball players primarily. Okay. Um, I've, I've been introducing um, kettlebells to uh, Major League Baseball athletes, mm -hmm. um, especially this this past off season since November, and that's having a great great effect uh, in terms of developing the athleticism. Because a lot of uh, professional athletes don't necessarily have a good understanding about how to uh, best condition themselves yeah. um, outside of the sport. You know, mm -hmm. they might have been exposed to bodybuilding or, or powerlifting protocols, which many times is not the the most efficient use of time in terms of developing their overall athleticism, which yeah. which also includes flexibility and um, range of motion and these types of things. Um, I suppose something so, like uh, um, baseball as well, they're, they're going to be so kind of dominant on kind of one side, aren't they? Or kind of one that's one true. Movement. So, um, yeah, it seems to be kind of and that it's going it's to create its own issues, isn't it? So, yeah, so that, that, uh, that, uh, that asymmetry, that bilateral asymmetry, um, definitely in a, in a sport like baseball or tennis where they're using, you know, dominant one side of their body, obviously that can lead to, uh, you know, deficiencies in the kinetic chain. And, um, you know, one of the, it's not unique, but one of the values of kettlebell training, at least in the strength training realm, uh, that is very unique from other methods is it it um it definitely focuses more on movement patterns as opposed to just uh uh particular muscles and and um a lot of the common training protocols whether you're talking about powerlifting, bodybuilding crossfit they tend to be very much dominant and create a lot of uh, internal rotation yeah. uh as well as, well as a lot of adduction and this can cause uh this can cause asymmetries over time. The kettlebells tends to bring the body more into the anatomical position. It tends to encourage more of an external rotation, more of an adduction, which is going to be more uh, similar to the, the natural posture or the anatomical position. And so it's a useful tool in that sense. Um, nothing magic about the kettlebell. It's just, just the type of movements that we're using uh, tends to encourage a three-dimensional athleticism. 
which has a lot of transferability into daily activities into most sports which uh you know which rely on a, a well-roundedness yeah. um, baseball is a great example of that they you know to be an, an effective player they, they can't just be skillful in one aspect they need to be able to need to be able to run well need to be able, be able to throw well need to be able to hit uh you know need need to be able to uh uh field very well so it, it you know and if they if they don't have a good game in one aspect of the game, they can have a good good, as, a good game in another aspect to help their team win, maybe with good defense or maybe with good base running, not just hitting. hitting. So um, there's a lot of uh, room for growth in these types of training protocols like kettlebell training. And um, I've always integrated it with, with other holistic uh, concepts, uh, deep breathing, meditation, stress reduction. Yeah. And um, obviously another component is the longevity because it, it's not just what you can do when you're 20 years old or 30 years old, but when you're 40, 50, 60 and beyond. So it's kind of that long-term approach. And can, can I ask you as well what your kind of view is? Um, um, it's what I've always found of kind of working with athletes or kind of what I've viewed is it's almost like once they, once they start to focus on longevity a little bit, suddenly they're kind of, that will enhance their performance as well because of all the systems and tools that they're using with that. Is that kind of one of the reasons why you use it or is that, is that what you find? Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, the, the two go together because I mean, I mean, there's, there's athletic performance, which is your, you know, your statistics, if you will. Um, and that's, that's, that's what the professional athletes are paid for. But then there's performance in the general sense, which is your ability to do your, your daily tasks, your daily activities. So everybody has performance interests. It's not uh, limited to say, uh, you know, competitive athletes. Um, and again, part of performance is your ability to stay healthy. So you may, you may have exceptional athletic skill, but if your body is not in balance, if there's some uh, dramatic asymmetries, which, which are eventually going to lead to injury, there's, there's no way to have performance if you can't, if you're, if you're not on the field, so to speak. So the longevity absolutely ties into, um, ties into the performance. Um, Again, using the example of baseball, just because that's a sport where I'm working a lot more in that area. Um, you, know, you know, now in, in Major League Baseball, it's what they're called as sort of the, um, well, they went through the kind of kind of the steroid years where all the player, you know, 90% of the people were, were using performance enhancing drugs. And, and you're going to see that in, in pretty much every sport at the highest levels, not just professional, but amateur, you know, but baseball made a very aggressive move to kind of clean up the game. Yeah. And so in, in today's era, compared to, say, 10 years ago when guys were hitting the ball, you know, 500 feet and, you know, 80 home runs a year type of thing where it just got kind of cartoonish. Um, since then, they've cleaned the game. And, and so now there's a lot more focus on the overall athleticism of the players because they understand these guys aren't probably going to be hitting 60 home runs. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe they're going to come back down the earth. Maybe a good, a good player will hit 30, 35 home runs. But if he's running well, if he's moving well, if he's not missing game games, um, again, they're able to contribute in, in, you know, more different aspects of the game. And, and so that's, it's a really good time to be involved with it. For, yeah, it's for really folks. encouraging like, to see it as well. Uh, I, I yeah. didn't know that was going on in baseball. And uh, when you see what's happening, it kinda, every, like you say, in every sport, it kinda, all the top levels, Basically, it's it's a big thing now, isn't it? Especially within martial arts at the moment as well. It's a huge thing. Um, so it's really encouraging to hear that. And actually, the, the, even the fans are still willing to see a little dip in kind of that machine-like performance to kind of clean the game up and then still enjoy the kind of rawness of it and see what it's all about. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of. I mean, a lot of it is is political and has to do with cultural mores and things like that. And I didn't, you know, I don't judge it one way or the other, but you know, certainly for me, I try to follow the uh, what you might call the Hippocratic oath that, that physicians take in, in, in that respect, even though I know as a trainer, uh, we're not physicians, there is a, a certain foundation that is the same. And, you know, that is the, the first rule of a trainer is not to injure the person. You know, it's not about performance. It's rule one, don't don't injure Safety. someone. And then from there, with that foundation, now we try to improve performance. And so, um, you know, for me, that's that's always the first thing is the health. Uh, health and wellness always precedes uh, athletic performance. And, you know, so 
from that point of view, that's where, uh, you know, aside from professional athletics, the, the performance enhancing drugs and these type of things, um, there's not an, enough information about, about it. Uh, it. It's really uh, troublesome to see young, young athletes, especially young people, uh, they're looking for, you know, try to put on mass or, or this type of thing. And so they're willing to uh, uh, experiment with hormone replacement without really understanding the uh, kind of the, uh, the takeaway from that. And yeah. nothing in life is free. So, yeah. yeah, these types of things, whether it's steroids or so on, um, yes, they're going to increase strength. Yes, they're going to increase mass. However, at what risk? And maybe they, we don't understand what risk until they're maybe 40, 50 years old and have been having health implications. And, yeah. you know, so having this long-term, long-term approach is, is really important. But in sports, there's a, there's a lot of hypocrisy and culturally there's a lot of hypocrisy. We want to see, you know, the, the greatest example probably in modern times is Lance Armstrong, the great American cyclist and, you know, Americans all of a sudden when he was winning all those Tour de France, they were became cycling fans. And yeah. previous to that, Americans never cared about Tour de France. And, you know, no one, no one, the French were after Lance for many years and accusing him of doping. And he was never, you know, he passed all the tests. And yeah. um, it was obvious 10 years ago that he, that he was, because if you know anything of thing about physiology and you know anything about his history, that you don't go from being kind of middle of the pack to the best that ever lived. Yeah. after surviving cancer just yeah. on hard work alone because yeah. at that level they're all working hard hard so you know uh it was no surprise when the eventually the kind of the, the truth the truth of it all came out that was kind of a no-brainer but the point i'm making is that um a lot of american fans were kind of willing to turn the blind eye and yeah. you know, defending him and because as they say say uh, everybody loves a winner and yeah you know and, and different cultures have different approaches like if you look at the russian system they don't even consider a lot of that stuff drugs they consider it vitamins and it's yeah. not a, it's not it's not a it's not doesn't have the same uh, negative stigma that a lot of uh, western nations may have towards mm -hmm. those type of things so there there's still a disconnect between uh reality and how society wants to see things we don't want to believe that our heroes rose are taking these types of substances yeah. but yeah you know in reality a lot a lot of people are a lot of physicians and a lot of uh, lawyers and entertainers are taking uh, what they don't call it drugs now they call it, call it hormone replacement but yeah. um you know but there's a better way there's other ways and it has to do with with learning more about you know i think the the Asian, uh, traditional Asian arts often offer a lot in terms of the Qigong, the meditation. There's ways to naturally uh, improve our, our hormonal profile. There's ways yeah. to slow down the aging process. Um, you know, and then just uh, consistency and, and intelligence in terms of how we eat and our, our exercise habits. All these things contribute to a, a healthy, long life, I believe. And can I just ask you a little bit more about the Qigong kind of meditation side of things? Because that... Uh that surprised me a little bit on the CKT workshop that you you added so much of that in, but it was a kind of it was a real pleasure to get exposed to some of it as well, um, and felt like you know after kind of after working really hard at the end of the day and kind of been training for hours, kind of doing all the kettlebells and lots of movement drills, it just kind of pulled it all together, didn't it? it just kind of set set you up and put you into recovery mode, and it was like okay, I, I can come back and do this again tomorrow. So. Is, is that kind of why you introduce that? Is it just something that you kind of feel um, has to be part of a kind of full, complete training program? And, and to ask another question on top of that, what are your kind of favorite, favorite recovery strategies? Um, yes, as to your first question, it, it was the reason that, uh, that I have included uh, some Qigong into the kettlebell curriculum with the CKT. Um, it's certainly not the only recovery method it's something that i have a lot of personal experience with and i'm i'm a in terms of what i teach i'm a firm believer to to um you know part of integrity is sticking to what you know so i don't try to try to go into into areas that i don't have a lot of personal experience with so the qigong is something i've had a lot of uh, personal experience with and um a, a lot of success with uh and, and definitely, definitely that will be at near the top of the list in terms of strategies as, as far as recovery. Yeah. Um, you know, certain aspects of yoga, you know, again, yoga is kind of a generic 
term. It, it, it yeah. can mean a lot of different things to many people. Um, but it's sort of an umbrella term to describe some of the Hindu uh, traditional arts. Mm. Uh, and, and a lot of what people are calling yoga now, nowadays or really have been influenced <clears throat> by more uh, European training methods, very aggressive, very athletic. And, um, but, but the original yoga had more to do with the breathing and the meditative, more soft, uh, recuperative. So in that way, they're very um, complementary pro properties to the Qigong, which is kind of describes the Chinese healing arts. Um, those are some of the better methods um, that I found for increasing um, recovery, longevity. Certainly, mm -hmm. certainly rest, rest is key. Um, stress reduction is very high on that list. Um, mm -hmm. Nutrition is very high on that list. Um, but, you know, nutrition is a very broad area and there, there, there's not like a template that one method yeah. of eating is best for everybody. Um, yeah. So it's, it's about dialing it in for the individual and finding a, a workable uh, eating uh, are there lifestyle. Any, are there any kind of basic principles that you think everyone should at least cover one or you know a couple of foundations as far as diet is concerned. Um, yeah, there are, and um, you know, usually when you when you look at different uh, nutrition programs, you'll hear a lot of different arguments. Some will say you have to eat, you know, um, you have to eat lean animal proteins. You have to eat this much fat. You have to avoid, you know, whether it's a paleo, they're going to say you have to avoid these things. Um, yeah, I don't really get into that in terms of the details because um, there there's very valid arguments that can be made for almost every type of diet out there. Yeah. There's health, healthy people that eat almost only mm -hmm. meat. There's also healthy people that are vegan and they're complete opposite and they both probably have validity. So, my point of view is if we kind of move away from from what to eat and look at some other things, how to eat. So it's some, you know, there's a saying, it's not, it's not just what we do, it's how we do it. You know, so something that everyone will benefit, obviously chewing, chewing our food. Yeah. Um, digestion begins in the mouth. It doesn't begin in the mm -hmm. stomach. So chewing the food, food and Im improving the mastication process is going to have a positive effect on everybody, regardless of what they're chewing. Um, you know, other things in terms of something that I'm a, a, a big advocate of or that I believe in is, is a concept called food combining, which can be very detailed. But the general idea is that uh, different categories of food um, require different enzymes to digest and take different rates of digestion. For example, animal proteins like red meat. Mm. Is take is the longest. It takes the longest to uh, to digest. It's, it could take say four hours if you were to eat a, a hamburger or a steak. It might take four hours before that hunk of meat starts to move from your from your stomach and begin the digestion process into the intestines. Um, whereas say uh, if you eat a hand you know a bowl of grapes, it's only going to be about thirty minutes. Yeah. That the, and so, you know, the basic idea of food combining is we don't mix certain foods. We would never eat meat and fruits together, for example, yeah. because in that sense, if you eat, say, say uh, if, you, if you eat some grapes and a, and a steak together, what's going to happen is after 30 minutes, the, the fruit wants to start to digest, but the meat is preventing it. Yeah. So what happens is, you know, the, the intestines are, uh, they're like pipes. They're, they're warm, they're damp, they're dark. It's a... It's an environment where bacteria can thrive. And so, you know, you have a, a situation where you're not digesting optimally. It creates uh, indigestion, it creates bloating, creates gas, uh, can create inflammation. All of this interferes with optimal digestion and it interferes with optimal health. If you're not digesting well, you can't be fully optimized in your, in your, in your well-being. Um, so, you know, so the idea of food combining is learning what foods can be eaten with each other, what foods need to be eaten separately, and there's a there's a process behind that. So, you know, any any listener that's interested, they can do a basic search on food combining and, and kind of get the overview on that. Um, another thing is, you know, not to mix your uh, – you shouldn't be drinking while you're eating. You know, drink be before because uh, obviously the, the, en the enzymes are uh, – we don't want to dilute the enzymatic function uh, yeah. of foods. If you tend towards a more alkaline diet versus an acidic diet, um, yeah. acidic foods are going to be, be foods like uh, uh, 
fried foods are going to be more acidic. Uh, heavy meats, especially red meats, are going to be more acidic. Uh, alcohol is acidic. Caffeine is going to be acidic. Uh, uh, heavily processed foods, they tend to be more acidic. Um, we know in our, our basic biology, we, we want to try to strive for a neutral uh, pH. Yeah. We don't want to be too acidic or too alkaline. We kind of want to be right in that, that happy medium. And so there are other food, foods that tend to be more al alkaline are going to be more cooling for the body. Uh, and those tend to be more living food foods, uh, vegetables, fruits. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, so in general, it's not to say eat only fruit, only vegetable. But if you're eating you know, a heavily processed diet, uh, a, a, t a typical British diet or a typical American diet is not a healthy diet. You know, the meat and potato diet is not a, it's not a good diet for longevity. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying don't eat meat, but if you tend to like a lot of meat, mix in more veggies, try to eat more veggies, maybe smaller portions of meat. Um, you know, it, it, basically you're, you're never going to see an obese. You're never going to see a hundred, hundred year old person that's obese. You know, there's. Yeah. You're never going to. Um, yeah, that's, know, that's a really good statement there, actually. Yeah. So if you want to live a long time, the sooner we pay attention to, to not just what we eat, but the function, the digestion, because yeah. digestion is a part of the, it's, it's what goes in must come out. And if you're eating perfect ingredients, but it's not digesting, you're not optimizing. And so, and so, um, yeah, that's kind of where I come in on the nutrition thing. And of course we can talk about different ingredients and, and, you know, there's, I have my opinions about that and there's other people that have different opinions yeah. about, about yeah. that, but as long as there's a logical process and it can be tested, and verified, then you know you found something that works for you. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point, and kind of the example of the steak and the, the bowl of grapes, because you could weigh them up and say, you know, kind of a good quality cut of meat, good quality steak, it's really good for you. Bowl of grapes, okay, but kind of natural sugar and stuff, but not bad for you. So people think it's okay just to kind of throw in, well, it's good for me, it's fine, it's not high in calorie or, or whatever it is. You know, they can justify it that way, but actually. How you respond to the things, and um, you know, I suppose the kind of same should should be said for our training as well. You know, how you respond to a certain type of training. You're doing lots of endurance work, and it's, it's not working for you. Don't keep doing endurance work because it's working for you know your your body. Your body, and you know maybe you want to kind of balance it out with some strength and flexibility or whatever. So, uh, which is what I really liked about your approach. Again, that real kind of complete approach, um, and, and again by the same of things as well, you could go on about diet, you could go on about meditation, about recovery, and it's, you know, it's a real kind of pleasure to, to hear that kind of experience, um, and, and, and that kind of search for all these different systems, uh, and still kind of hungry to learn more as well. Yeah, 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 it's an ongoing, it's a lifelong, uh, er, you know, any of these things can be lifelong areas of study, but for me, the, the acid test, or they're saying the proof of the pudding is in the eating, at the end of the day, um, you know, trainers, physical educators need to be keen observers, and we may have a particular dogma or philosophy, which is fine, but can't be so rigid. We have to really observe the results, and if someone is, you know, if they're not responding well, we need, we need to change the formula. We can't be so locked into our way of doing things that we lose track of the observation, and, you know, the proof of the pudding in terms of physical programs is how do, how do you feel? How are you moving? Are you pain free? Yeah. Um, you know, and so if any of those things don't check out, we need to figure out, out okay, what, what's causing the, the problem and, and see if we can adjust it. Uh, that, that's what I, what I believe. So I, I don't think I have uh, all the answers and, you know, my program works well, but in general, when I'm working with athletes, I'm constantly getting feedback. I'm asking them, how does this feel? Yeah. You know, um, um, and, if they say, oh, well, you know, maybe I have a program in mind, but if they give me feedback, that's going to indicate that I need to adjust the program. I'm going to adjust the program, you know, because yeah. it's really about uh, the results that you're providing to them. It's not about me or my program. It's, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm there to help them. So I, I think of it, it's a service. We're in a service industry. If you want to use the word industry, we're there to serve other people, not, not yeah. to just promote ourselves. Yeah, and kind of inspire them as well to become more aware so that they can actually give you the, the correct feedback, can't they? So, um, yeah, yeah, the education, yes. 
Cool. Steve, I know you're I know you're um, tight for time. You've got to go off and off and kind of sunbathe or something, haven't you? Do a workout on the beach by the looks of it. Um, no, actually, uh, my, my uh, son my, my son and one of my daughters are getting out of school in a bit, so uh, oh, cool. I'm going to cool. head, out, head out to pick them up in a, in a little bit here. Good, good, stuff. Um, good stuff. But i got a few more minutes anyway, so um, yeah. yeah, well, well, yeah just, uh, to, just to kind of wrap things up, um, first of all, you're, kinda, you're all over YouTube and stuff, doing lots of cool stuff, so I'm sure people kind of find you on YouTube. If people want to come and um, even just kind of find out a little bit of more information that you give out or kind of do one of your courses, how can they find you? Um, well, thanks for asking. Uh, the first reference point is going to be uh, uh, the website, which is ikff.com. And, um, you, you know, there's a contact link there. If somebody wants to email me directly, they can do that via ikff.com. Um, um, a good resource that folks... Uh, would be interested in is um, I recently started uh, writing um, ongoing articles for a network called about.com. It's a very large, large uh, online network. And uh, my, my section is called kettlebells.about.com. So, um, you know, if anyone wants to read articles related to, to that, um, there's lots of, lots of free information there. Um, YouTube channel, which is the IKFF channel. Um, there's lots of video instructionals there, as you've mentioned. Um, so, you know, follow me on cool. Twitter, Twitter, follow me on Facebook, that type of stuff. So, um, yeah, you can definitely get a hold of me if, if you so fancy to do to do that. Yeah, yeah, good stuff, good stuff. Lots of good information as well. Um, I've checked it all out. I'm working on lots of it anyway. So, I don't know the plan. Going to be to out. Um, uh, so, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. No, no, that's um, good. Too. Going to be out in Ireland in May between, uh, say, the 15th and the 22nd uh, doing a tour in uh, Limerick and uh, Galway and uh, where else? Cork, uh, Belfast, Dublin. And um, I know you're not Ireland, but not not too far. Um, tentative plan to, to, to do a, a visit out in UK. Looks like probably last half of June or, or maybe in July. So, um, you know, once I get that sorted, I'm going to put those events on the IKFF uh, website, site calendar, and anyone that's interested in yeah. maybe, uh, you know, participating in one of my classes, that'll be an opportunity yeah. for yeah. folks over on the other the other side of the pond yeah. from here, anyway. I'd, I'd head, head over to Ireland, but I've got a baby Jimmy Joe on the 13th of May, so uh, that's so awesome. I don't know if you let me, so... Um, <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Be that's like far more... Yeah. yeah, far more important, uh, far more important... Uh, that's that's great. Congratulations to your family, and wish you guys uh, great great uh, health there. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll look to we'll look to catch up with you in the UK, and, and um, yeah, yeah, it was always a pleasure catching up with you, and, and thanks for your time. Um, oh, thank you very you much, should... Craig. Yeah, my pleasure, and um, you know, thanks for listening for everyone out there that's that's uh, tuning in, and uh, be happy to come back and catch up with you guys again next opportunity that's it. thanks steve okay thanks a lot craig thanks, cheers take care man